so much. Well, thank you for making me a doctor. I really appreciate it because, in fact, I'm not. I hold a master's in ag journalism from Wisconsin. However, my first name is Dennis, my middle name is Randall, and my last name is Dimmick. So, in fact, I am Dr. Dimmick. <laughs> okay, so what, what am I going to do today with you? I'm going to talk to you about the origination of a series on global food security that we've published in National Geographic starting in May of 2014, why it came about, and I'm going to show you some of the work, and uh, essentially also what's coming up. And so uh, this project started, and it was a, a, it's actually become one of the most popular series we've ever done, uh, uh, great uh, advertising support. I need to step back, though, and go to the beginning. And let's start here. So this is, you need to understand why did this come to be because it came out of my own being and my own passion and, my, and, and what I was as in the very beginning. So I grew up here. This is one of my first published pictures. This is uh, Mount Hood uh, in the Cascade Mountains taken about two miles from our farm. Uh, this is me earning money to go to college baling hay, cut, rake, and bale, $10 a ton when we started it. We got up to 12 by the time I was uh, out of college. Uh, this is one of the first pictures I had published. This is my uh, younger brother, Rick. We raised registered and purebred Suffolk sheep. This lamb had just been born. And then uh, I was studying agriculture to be a high school VOAG teacher, FFA. My older brother uh, was a VOAG teacher for 30 years. Um, and I bought a camera, and so the paths diverged, and I got into photography and journalism and communications. Uh, this is a portrait of my parents. This is in what would be called my later Grant Wood American Gothic phase, okay? <laughs> Both of them were fisheries biologists. We had a small farm uh, about 80 acres just south of Portland, Oregon, and so I grew up in this laboratory of farming sheep and uh, uh, we spent a lot of time up in the wilds of the Cascade Mountains of the, of the Northwest. And so the question comes down to why food now. I think it, it's part of a trajectory of coverage of uh, significant global issues. And I'll just quickly run through some of the things that we've done. In 2014, we did over 70 pages on global warming, it, the scientific basis, ecological impacts, and also paleoclimatology. In 2007, we were the first project to fund the work of Jim Baylog, who then went on to create um, Extreme Ice Survey. Uh, it was the story about the disappearing ice on the planet. We did special issues on climate change and on energy. Climate change and, and energy are two halves of the same whole. If you want to have a discussion about why the climate is changing, you need to talk about what kind of energy choices the world is making. One of those being, for example, biofuels. So we put that on the cover also in 2007. We looked at hydraulic fracturing. We know that that has transformed the world energy oil market. This uh, we looked in North Dakota in 2013. This is that issue that was mentioned on freshwater. Uh, we did a cover story on extreme weather, the rise of extreme weather, uh, rising seas. Uh, seven billion the series this was a year-long series in 2011 and I think this was it's a good inflection point because um, the editor of the magazine Chris Johns he and I actually were college roommates isn't it interesting how things happen uh, we both met each other in FFA in high school in the state of Oregon uh, he went one way I went another we came back together at the geographic at, uh, around uh, the two, 2001 and started working together on these projects, he became essentially a big supporter of my wacky ideas, including this. And the question I asked afterwards was at the end of the population series, well, so fine, we're talking about population, but the big question now is gonna be what's gonna be for lunch? And maybe we need to start helping raise the profile of this issue for our global readership. And we had been doing that, we put on the cover we put on the cover uh, soil conservation in 2008 and talking about patients, it took nine years to get this story published from the time I wrote the first proposal. So it takes, just like taking a long time to build soil, sometimes these stories do take a long time to build constituencies and support. And I think the key thing that we were trying to say there was that 
in large measure, the success of a society, a culture, a civilization, a country is going to be dependent upon the quality of the soil that is in that country, the soil that you inherit. So you can see this woman in Mali, the, the woman in China, guess who has the better life? Uh, the farmer in the deep, loamy soils of Kansas or the man with the rocks in Syria. I think pictures like these go a long way to help explain why we read about certain news events. We also looked in, as part of our population series, we looked at the preservation of genetic diversity in the food system. This is Carrie Fowler from the Global Crop Diversity Trust. It's at, at what is called the Doomsday Vault. It is the global, it is the seed bank in Svalbard. And what is intriguing about that, that's where all the seeds from the seed banks around the world go. Um, and that, that vault actually has been built at an elevation above sea level high enough so that when, if all the ice on the planet were to melt and seas were to rise, this place would still be above sea level. And so that's where the, all food comes from the grains, the cereals, the grasses. And so that's, that was what we were trying to help explain, that, that everything comes from a preservation of gen, gen, diversity. And it's like when you look at this image of UG99, which is a wheat stem virus that's decimating wheat crops across the uh, Middle East and North Africa, the only way you can get that out of the crops is to uh, breed in resistance. You can't use antibiotics, you can't use pesticides. And this is a, one of the key reasons why you need to preserve genetic diversity. But underlying all this question was the world is changing. And there's a few conditions. One, we're seeing a uh, rising population. And we tried to begin to address this. This story actually that we published in June of 09, the end of plenty was actually a prototype for the whole food series. And it was, the, uh, what we were looking at, it was, it was actually caused by the price spikes of 07 and 08 and, and why the unrest was happening. And that became, uh, caused us to begin focusing on the issue. But long term, the issues are basically like this. We're dealing in rising population and we know that in 1900, we were only 1 1.6 billion and then there was a great acceleration in the 20th century and by 2000, we were 6.1, the numbers flipped. Uh, 2013, we were at 7.1 and by, by mid-century, the UN projects 9.6 and maybe by the end of the century, it's gonna be 11 billion. That's a lot of mouths to feed, right? But also there's rising aspirations, and this is one of the reasons why we see the de desire to double food production by mid-century. It's not just more people, it's eating higher on the food chain. Because we're eating better, we move up the food chain, we grow grains not to eat for ourselves, but to feed, to, uh, to put onto ships and ship to countries that want to eat more meat. This is soybeans, that was corn because more and more people want to eat higher on the food chain, uh, higher quality proteins, more livestock protein, and that's where you get your rising demand for food because you know, a pound of grain gives you a loaf of bread, it takes eight pounds of grain to grow a pound of beef, and that's where you get the magnification and resource demand. Here is a, a meat market in China. But then it's also expansion of agricultural footprint. This is. Uh, this is burning of, of forests in South America. This is where the big action is happening now. We're seeing expansion of agricultural footprint. And Ken Kassman of the University of Nebraska in 2014 at the World Food Prize, as he was a provocateur in a discussion about how are we doing, he said, look, th since the turn of the century, the biggest way we have been increasing world uh, harvest is not by increasing yield, but by increasing footprint. And we've been converting about 10 million acres a year to agricultural land. And this is what you get. So you go from these rich, uh, biologically diverse communities to monoculture. And so we're getting food, but there's also a price that we pay. And then the third part of this really is rising temperatures, which is changing the envelope that we're all trying to farm in. If you look here, Arctic sea ice from 79 to 2012 is a pretty good indicator of changes underway. In 79, the first pictures of the, of the Arctic ice cap were taken by satellites, and this is what it looked like at the end of the summer when all the ice is melting and then it's, it reaches equilibrium. By 2012, half of it had disappeared. So that changes many things, including weather, how, um, uh, which is a, a big factor in the success of agriculture because we know temperatures and precipitation applied at the right amount in the right time are essential for success. 
we're also seeing hot summers. And this was a, a study that came from David Battisti at University of Washington and Ross Naylor from Stanford. And this is this story, this study came out in 09. And, and sorry for the blow up, but I think the idea really here is that the percentage of summers warmer than the warmest summer on record was projected using the, they used all the, the sort of uh, projected scenarios from the, the IPCC um, um, uh, climate report from 07. They were trying to figure out what percentage of summers by mid-century would be hotter than we've ever seen before. And so you can see in the yellow and the red, that's like, that's trending f above 50% towards 100%, but by the end of the century, this is what you get. And the, the rub in all this is that about 3.5 billion people live between 30 degrees north latitude and 30 degrees south latitude, where much of the agriculture is dependent, essentially is subsistence rain-fed agriculture. And when you change the temperature envelope, the rainfall patterns are gonna shift too. So you have rising population, rising aspirations, and rising temperature. That's sort of a, a nexus of these three things that really became the conditions that were driving us to say, we need to talk about this issue now, to try to raise public awareness of it, to have a conversation. Look, I'm, I'm one of those ag majors in college, and I felt like I was like, you know, we got sent off to the west end of campus, and ag never really got talked about. It was kind of like, we were taken for granted, and now what we're seeing is people are starting to pay attention because there's a confluence of these conditions. And so we're really, what we're trying to do with this project really was to raise awareness, start a conversation, reconnect eaters with farmers, reconnect farmers, uh, uh, eaters with landscapes, and to understand the implications of our, of our desires and, uh, and our diets. And so that became the, be that was the impetus in the beginning for this series, and I will quickly run through you the, the, the main ideas that we tried to do and the opening gambit was where will we find enough food for nine billion? And the idea really was what we were trying to do was try to help people realize that it can, we can make a difference if we think about what we're doing. And so what we did, uh, it says it doesn't have to be industrial farms versus small organic ones, there is another way. And what we did was we actually uh, took advantage of a study that was published from the University of Minnesota's Institute on the Environment. Jonathan Foley at the time was director of it, and it was a, a story that was, it was a study that was published on the cover of Nature in October of 2011, and it was the first time I'd ever seen sort of a framework for having a conversation about how we can confront these issues, and it was called Solutions for a Cultivated Planet, and it came in five parts. Adapt to agriculture for a changed climate, or should we go back and look to see if there were some crops that were never brought forward and we might be thinking about as ways to broaden our resilience in food production. Uh, the whole thing is available. You can actually go to the iTunes store and if you have an iPad, you can download the Nat Geo Future of Food app. And we've also tried to do a significant online push. Um, we've done a couple of movies and as part of the collaboration with the Food and Agriculture Organization of the UN, uh, we put together this little movie that's been very popular on YouTube and is shareable and it's out there and it's called Food by the Numbers and I'll run this. That's a couple of minutes and then I can come back and uh, we have about 10 minutes left for questions. So um, one thing I would say is that as I look forward though, um, I think one area that I remain incredibly um, drawn to and interested in is uh, this nexus between uh, climate change and food security and uh, the need for um, fortifying actually agricultural research. I think this is one area that uh, we, we need to keep. It's an undertold story and I hope that I can have an impact on that kind of part of the discussion in years ahead. Thank you. Yes, thank you for a really interesting and entertaining presentation. I'm Stuart Craig with DuPont, and my question is around um, earlier this morning, that our session really opened around suspicion of science, suspicion of large institutions, the mood of consumers. How do, how do you take this and address some of those roadblocks that we're seeing around that type of suspicion? Well, we have actually addressed the war on science. It was a cover story in the magazine in March of 2015. 
and we did try to uh, parse those issues. I think that's a big question. Uh, um, I don't really have a good answer for you, but it, I think we've, uh, Joel Achenbach, who is a reporter for the Washington Post, wrote a great piece. It's like, it's part of the issue that we're facing is that it's not just about facts, it's about emotion and it's about your worldview and, and it, what, what and, and, and this issue of big institutions versus uh, and what they have to say, it, it's, a, it's a very difficult and complex question. Thanks. But it's certainly one we have to keep our, our eye on and, and keep paying attention to. Mike? Yeah, thank you, Darrell. Thank you, Mr. Dimmick. It was an excellent presentation, and, and I commend you for educating the public in this area. But, you know, growing food is a complex situation. And uh, I like the concept that you brought up about aquaculture, and, and, you know, we can produce a lot more protein through aquaculture than we can beef, for example. But there's a lot of complications in growing aquaculture. Uh, oftentimes, because it's so highly sustainable, they use raw manure as, as the nutrients for the ponds. And that brings salmonella, harmful microbes, not only to us humans, but also uh, to the fish and to the shrimp. And then that leads to excessive use to antibiotics. And so there's a big concern about antimicrobial resistance. So these are, these are points that I think would be helpful for the public to know and, and, and address as, as part of their uh, thinking about, you know, what foods are good for us and, and what to eat. Uh, another example you brought up is food waste, and I think that's very important. And, you know, we, we add, uh, I'm, a, I'm a food microbiologist and a very strong proponent of the importance of adding antimicrobial food preservatives to foods because they have a lot of significance in controlling the harmful microbes that may be there, but also the ones that cause spoilage. And as there's a move afoot, like Chipotle being an example, to reduce the use of preservatives, we're more than likely going to see much shorter shelf lives of foods, leading to more, more food waste. So I think it's very important that consumers be educated in these, these, these areas or why these types of components are added and, and uh, what can be done if, or what's going to happen if we eliminate all these. Uh, all good points. I, I would like to say, though, that y you need to understand this series was not meant for you guys. This series were, was meant for people who don't pay attention, who where food waste or uh, aquaculture aren't even part of the conversation. We're just trying to get people to pay attention to the fact this stuff exists. And, you know, it is difficult at some point, remember, you need to understand that we do stories that nobody has to read. Nobody has to buy what we do. So we actually have to frame these things in ways that are going to cause people want to want to pay attention. If we publish things that look like a study that came out of science, no one is going to read them. And so we're, you know, we're, we are in a, we're sort of in this position of, of trying to find a balance between, you know, the facts and also the uh, getting people to pay attention. So it's, it's, it's hard, but at the same time, I think we, all we can do often is raise questions. And nobody said that the story that we did on uh, aquaculture provided all the answers. It likely raised more questions than answers. But you see, you have to get people to be thinking about these things. And that, to me, is one of the big benefits of trying to do this over a long time in a concerted way. It, it's like food security has got many dimensions to it, right? And aquaculture is just one. Food waste is just another. Whether we're going to cut all the forest down on the planet is another. Where we're, whether we're going to eat a, a T-bone steak every day and whether that's good for our health and whether the planet can sustain it. Those are all just kind of questions that we're trying to help people think about that they're not even thinking about otherwise. I, I got you, and, I, and I'm not trying to be critical. I'm trying to be constructive and, and, and plant some seeds for future issues. Thank you. Thanks. Great. Joe? Uh, Brent Koblish from Cargill. Oh. Um, Thank you for your support of our project. You're welcome. <laughs> um, quick question. You know, when we, when we talk about GMO, and that's a big, uh, right. you know, 
topic of discussion right. among, so piggybacking on your comments to Dr. Doyle, <clears throat> you know, consumers view GMO and then crop crossbreeding as one and the same. That's right. Um, how do you, because I haven't seen all your publications, can you comment on whether or not you or Nat Geo and, and others um, are talking about those differences and making a distinction between the two? Yeah, that's what that story was I showed you. It was all about the difference. It was like, you know, biotech is not just GMO. And a, center part of, a central part of that story was to say, look, we need to move beyond just this, this sort of question about GMOs and uh, that biotech is much more than ge just genetically modified organisms. And uh, that, that story actually tried to explain that, that genomics, uh, um, marker gene identification, all those kinds of things are, they get lumped into the same pile, but they're completely different. And that was really what we were trying to do. And uh, I would recommend, if you haven't seen the story, read it. Uh, I was, you know, whether it's good or bad, I will just tell you that, that last October, the, a year ago in October at the World Food Prize, Bob Fraley of Monsanto held that story up and said, look, if you want to understand what's going on, read this story. Okay. Yes, sir, Michael. Um, Michael McBurney, DSM Nutritional Products. Um, Dennis, thank you. I really enjoy seeing the work that you've done and contributed. And so the question for you is, is there anything that you would like to see LC or the, the audience here that would help move this forward that you think is an opportunity? Uh, great question. Um, you know, I just feel like that this, the reason that we did this series in the first place is uh, that we wanted to, to make food part of the dialogue of, in the American public. And I have two college-age children who are paying attention to food issues, and, and we're, we were trying to help inform the public about this. As as far as your organization, I think that it's, you know, in one in one way it's 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 important to talk about the issues. It's in another way it's very important to do it in ways that are effective and powerful and visual and graphically appealing. And I know one of the biggest questions that we often face is like, well, we have a really important subject. How are we going to make it in, informative and entertaining? And I don't use, I'm not using that in a, a negative connotation, but it, in the context of uh, making people want to pay attention to what you have to say is, is a question of aesthetics and beauty and, and it's more than just the facts. And so I think if, what, if one is trying to produce, you know, printed or, or online communications, the, the, the sort of like the simplicity of it and the beauty of it can go a long way to get people's attention. Okay, other questions? We have a little more time. Please. Really enjoyed the presentation. Um, I, one of the uh, opportunities that I uh, really benefited from was you folks had an exhibit at the uh, museum there in DC, uh, which I happened to be in town that day and really enjoyed. Maybe you could comment on, on the impact of this. And, and just a small plug, part of the ILSI Research Foundation is in fact working on these issues. And for those who are at the poster session, please come join us. Thank you, yes, we actually, is, I mean, this, this food project was, and I mean, it is, it, it's a project that, that um, our president, Gary Nelf, feels very strongly that it's an issue that needs to, we need to keep beating the drum on. I mean, when the, when the, um, when the series was nearing its end, I kept saying, look, the, the issue here is that, well, we can do a publication cycle of a s series of stories that lasts a year, and then we turn our headlights to something else, but the facts are that this issue is only going to become more compelling and dramatic and, and important for people to pay attention to. And as part of that, sort of, as the uh, expansion of the duration of it, we also tried to ex sort of expand the breadth of this whole project so that it was more than just printed articles, and so we entered into a relationship with the American Museum of Natural History, and that exhibit originated up there, and then we brought it in for a period of time, and it was all about food in our lives, and it was, and we added particular dimensions that helped personalize it to us, but I think strategically for us, what it was, it was this idea, you need to reach 
people in many different ways. It's not just some printed article in a magazine. It's not just a posting on your Facebook page. There are many different avenues, uh, whether it's television programs, online. It's now we're living in a world where it's all of the above to try to get our message across. And I think that exhibit, which was a cool exhibit, was an added part of that whole strategy. Great. Dennis, thank you so much for, for being here, being a part of our, our meeting. Uh, and I really want to congratulate you. And I think uh, I would certainly put in a plug here again for our land-grant universities. And in spite of the fact that I made you a doctor, uh, we're really, really pleased that you have those roots and you can bring the message that is being delivered in those universities and, and all of our universities. But I, but I, obviously my roots are in the land grant university and I appreciate the fact that, that you have brought a, a very significant message to us. I also want to congratulate Ilse North America. They've, we've been working on communication for a long time and I think to your point, Dennis, that we've been working on communications that have communicated the science, and, and a lot of times we are talking scientist to scientist, and we understand that the problem is really much, much deeper than that. It is how do we get consumers, how do we get the general public, how do we get others interested in that dialogue? Dennis, you have helped us move forward in that way. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for your time and attention today. I really appreciate the invitation to be here. Thanks. Great.